to our third week uh, of Cultures in Conversation as part of the program for People and Planet, commissioned by Expo 2020 and programmed by Al Circle Advisory. So the last week was dedicated to urban and rural development uh, as part of Cultures in Conversation STEM thematic week. And uh, we are honored to be able to close it today by asking what makes a city dimensions of culture and possibility of community in association with UN Habitat, Aga Khan Development Network, and Siemens. In partnering with Expo 2020, uh, Al Sarkal Advisory brought together some of the world's leading thinkers from various disciplines. Um, from academics to poets, from artists to researchers, uh, to address and reimagine critical contemporary issues we are faced with today. Uh, the program offers or allows for a meta-narrative um, that offers reflection, awareness, and re-envisioned approaches uh, as a result engendering new forms of knowledge, activating social discourse, and shaping borderless communities and a collaborative expo space. I'm happy to see many familiar faces here this afternoon. Thank you for your ongoing engagement program. And I would also like to visit, to invite you to visit ulcercal.online, where you can tune in for content and responses related to all themes. So why cities? Why is it important to talk about them? Why is it important for Expo to highlight the subject in partnership with intergovernmental bodies like UN Habitat during this very iconic moment uh, when COP26 is taking place in Glasgow? To start with, the number of people in urban areas as a proportion of global population uh, are projected to increase from 55% today to 68% by 2050, with close to 90% of this increase taking place in Asia and Africa. Global demand for energy is, and, and water is projected to increase by 50% in less than a decade by 2030. Let's not forget, cities already account for 70% of total resource consumption and at least 70% of energy-related greenhouse emissions. These symptoms demand questions, and they demand closer look at cities and its structures. Contemporary research is situated at a crossroads. It is outgrowing inherited approaches that failed to illuminate the great challenges that planetary urban environments are faced with today. And so it is with that intent that in the past few months, we engaged with our participating speakers um, to problematize and reinvestigate epistemologies and ontologies applied to cities. It was important to weave together multiple geographies to include cities that are usually off the map, allowing for multiple urban polarities, rhythms, textures, scales, and renewed perspectives and learnings. This vernacular approach allowed, enabled us to transcend uh, the borders of discipline and knowledge, allowing us to invite Charles Landry to present a keynote this afternoon alongside three case studies um, that we feel present different compositions uh, of cities of which perhaps we know too little. These very thoughtful and in-depth perspectives challenge the very definitions of urban and rural and include voices from Bahrain, Johannesburg, and Mumbai. So we expect the cities to be safe, organized, lean, with policies designed to address key issues. We expect these policies to promote successful 
economies, um, uh, cultural dynamism to help us heal the divide across our societies. But as Richard Sennett, a very well-known uh, scholar, urban scholar and thinker, has put it, quote, these are not the cities we live in. This is in part because the city is not its own master. And I think that's the emphasis I would like to uh, place here. The city is not its own master. The city is dependent in, on its own circulation, on flows of cultural, economic, uh, social, environmental, political forces. No? That's something that is really important to consider. And it is this epistemic curiosity um, that drives us to examine the in-between, the invisible, reflecting this multivocality of the urban. In other words, by understanding what cities are and what makes them, we can begin to question how can they become better. Are we still making or unmaking cities? We will address the symptomatic need for a deeper exploration and investigation in the kind of rules that we apply to city shaping, or perhaps question whether we need any rules at all. But further, we shall dissect epistemic narratives and look at the metabolism of cities reflecting the evolutionary city cells, their porosity, resilience, and flows. Let's consider the image in the background uh, this afternoon, a work by Sarab Ura titled An Incomplete Map of Interconnectedness. Growing, created for an exhibition at the Shara Art Foundation titled Growing Like a Tree, which is currently on view at El Sirkel Avenue. If I asked you today, what image comes to your mind about a particular city? Most likely it would be a skyline, maybe a symbolic building that's associated to that city, um, essentially built environment. When I saw this work, I thought it captured so well the intent of today's program. This is how we view a city. This kind of interconnectedness that of, of, of lines and borders that connect rather than separate. So today's thematic, what makes a city, dimensions of culture and possibility of community, encourages that departure away from fixity, embracing the incomplete form, the unknown, allowing us to rethink the possibilities um, that shape cities. The urban is viewed almost in the, as, in the form of a theater, or as Abdumalik Simone has put it, or called it, a field of rehearsal. In ways, instigating the fact that it's, there is no final act, it's a process. And so the carefully studied, research-informed views and presentations taking place this afternoon attempt to capture this very dimension of the urban. Simone is a well-known thinker who has extensively studied cities in the global south, a very well-recognized um, uh, uh, urban scholar. And, and I would like to conclude my opening remarks in his words. Quote, the key is how spaces get turned into crossroads, points and experiences of intersection. The key is how any place in a city can become a moment, an opportunity to create the experience of a crossroads where things intersect. In other words, take the opportunity to change each other around by the virtue of being in that space, getting rid of the familiar ways and plans for doing things, and finding new possibilities by virtue of whatever is gathered there. And so it is with that in mind that we invited urban innovator and global um, author Charles Landry this afternoon. It is difficult for me to recite his biography because there's quite a lengthy list of accomplishment, uh, accomplishments and publications under his name. 
but I would like, I mean, I'm sure many of you are familiar with his work and probably highlight some of his publications, The Creative City, uh, The Art of City Making, Psychology uh, of Cities, and, and really, he's perhaps the best known for um, having developed the creative city concept in which he emphasizes the imaginative action in shaping urban life. Therefore, therefore without any further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Landry on stage to begin today's program with his keynote on reinvigorating the creative city. to be here and great to see you all. I can't really see you, but you are there somewhere. Um, I want to start in a slightly strange way. Um, uh, I remember when I was a very young person, I went to Bilbao. It was a bit gray and all of that. And then I saw this steel factory and it was like a furnace. It was shooting up lights and stuff like that. And I thought to myself, isn't this beautiful? But it happened to be the same year when the Club of Rome report came out, which of course set on the whole notion of sustainability. And so what I once thought was beautiful, I decided was actually ugly. And I asked myself a question, did producing that steel hurt the earth? But I probably forgot about that, as you can well imagine. But that started a long journey for me, which relates to the creative city. And what I was then asking myself, Obviously, we know we shape the city, the city shapes us. But it was about my idea at the time to try and broaden our intellectual architecture about you, how you think of place. For example, the sensory city, how you think of the psychological state of a city, and so on. And the one sentence summary of the creative city is really, in a world of dramatic change, how do you create the conditions to think, plan, and act with imagination to solve problems and create opportunities. And so that really is partly about this whole thing about the content and the container, the container and the content, the built and the, the non-built. And then 35 years later, the things came full circle again when I was asked by Bilbao, funnily enough, in 2007, to assess and develop a methodology of how you could look at a place completely comprehensively in every sense. And we devised sort of four domains, and we've done this work in many cities, but they are basically, the first is the conditions of accessibility, participation, all of these empowering things. How can you establish that in a city? How then do you create the enabling devices, incentives and regulations regime to foster and help that? Thirdly, how do you create the connections and so on to make lots of that happen? And fourthly, what is the lived experience of the city? And so we've looked at that in big and small places. But when I think of cities today, I sort of have shifted my mind. And I've asked myself the question recently, what would you do if nothing was there? Can you imagine what, what could be? What would you do? Would you impose your thoughts onto the canvas that is this physical place, or instead of those of nature? And of course, nature thinks too, and it doesn't particularly like what we're doing. It's fighting back. It's doing all sorts of things that I don't need to mention. But would we then go more with nature's rhythms than the other rhythms that we have perhaps created? And we might then cool with the wind and use natural materials more often, and so on. Now, why are we asking such fundamental questions? And I really do feel that 2020 was a year of radical reckoning. It really forced us perhaps to listen, and that perhaps has etched itself into our consciousness. And it was an, enforced, an unforced experiment in climate change emissions, um, in the incredible experiment it was. And it gave us a glimpse of another world. Perhaps that other world could be the potential planet B, although we have to do something about planet A. But it reminded us too obviously because you heard the birds sing and all of this sort of stuff, it reminds me at least, or us perhaps, of the forms of knowledge we, we have lost and as we've catapulted ourselves into a sort of logic of more and more. We forgot perhaps too how to tread carefully. And 
of course, many think and thought, oh, let's get back to the old normal. It's an exotic destination where we need to go. But those older urgencies, of, of course, still exist. And I think, most importantly, it made us realize that we're not alone and we're in this together. But I think the pandemic focused us on what really matters, which is obviously the common interest. And I think it also told us that civilization is a thin film of order. We wrap around the chaos of events. So fragility and vulnerability is really one of the watchwords. And most of us agree, I think, that a business as usual approach will not work anymore. You know, our economic order and way of life is materially expansive, socially divisive, and environmentally hostile. But of course, the solutions are there. And too often, we think it's technology which will do it. It has the authority and responsibility. And we sort of abnegate as if we uh, couldn't really do anything. But in fact, the real question, I think we all know, is that shift in behavior and that shift in mindset. And that mindset is a 360-degree mindset, one where we know that everything is inextricably interwoven. And that reminds me of three key words for me, mind flow, mindset, mind shift. Mind flow is the mind in operation. You know, we can't always be creative and all of that. We've got to eat and do normal things. Mindset is obviously our prejudices fixed, the things we believe in. And mind shift is obviously the thing when you actually manage to do that. And I'll come back to that a tiny bit later. But I think time is short, and we all know that. Um, uh, just that film showed us a second ago. But I think there are many driving this change, activists, politicians, civil society, inventors, architects, ar artists, business people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it is really important to harness this collective intelligence, energy, will, motivation, and of course, the resources that they collectively have to create that more human-centered place. Perhaps one should say human and nature-centered, I'm not quite sure. But I think by acting together, a massive potential happens. And I believe in that sense, we're not exhausted. Many people say we're all exhausted. We don't know what to do anymore. I don't think we're exhausted, particularly when you look across disciplines and take a helicopter view about the mass of solutions that exist in the fragments. And the question, of course, is trying to bring them together into a collective whole. And all of this is potentially transformative. But I think transformation itself is a cultural project. It is the biggest cultural project of our time because it's a cultural project, because it's about values, mindsets, it's about ethics, it's about all of those things, and attitudes, hearts, and skills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And being culturally literate in that sense, I think, is a powerful way of looking at things, because simplifying culture is who we are. Creativity can help us what we can become. Now, of course, I'm saying things that already are clear, you know, that the city is an organism, it's a metabolism. It's not just an inanimate clump of buildings that are inert and lifeless. It's a complex thing which is interacting. And of course, it's a cultural artifact itself because that built form is culturally conditioned. And it communicates through every fiber of its being. Is it communicating power? Or is it communicating humility? I mean, I'm just using two extremes there. And so that leads me to think, perhaps we could come to a rebirth, a renaissance. We know that older renaissance, that's one thing. This is a different form of renaissance. Because in that renaissance then, different ideas suddenly came together with a certain power. Our ideas today are things like the circular economy and so on. And what I think that can do, and this is a word I love, it could perhaps re-enchant the city or re-enchant what we do. And that process of re-enchanting, if we can allow ourselves, just chanting, which is about breathing in and breathing out, actually, I think, speaks to our deepest yearning, our soul, our sense of wanting to become whole again. 
which is why I think so many people are into yoga and mindfulness, although I think it should be called, personally, mind emptiness, but that's another story. Um, but anyway, this is all about um, getting the right balance. And here, too, I think how artists think can help this rebirth. Now, what exactly is it about the forms of art, you know, all the performance, dancing, designing, all of this writing and so on, that is so special? And I think what's special about it is it harnesses the imaginary realm in a way that other disciplines don't do. And that imaginary process, that capacity to imagine, forcing it, us to reflect, to confront things and do all of that, is the one where we can also imagine viscerally through heart, mind, body, stomach, everything else, what that planet B could be. Because we need to think viscerally, because otherwise we won't get the energy, given all the obstacles are there, to push this thing, this planet B project further. Obviously getting planet A right, I'm not trying to forget that. And nursing us through the green transition is in itself a creative act. And there the arts can help. The engagement with the arts, I don't need to tell you, you know, combines both stretching oneself and focusing. It's about broadening horizons, conveying important meanings and so on, and in depth. And sometimes it does it in a profound, immediate way, which is so iconic that you suddenly then say, oh, what was that? I now understand what happened. And sometimes, when it works well, it encapsulates these scattered thoughts you had, which were perhaps incoherent, and so on. And what is important, it's not a linear process. Now, I believe, and I think it's probably true, that we're driven by our emotional and sensory experience and that landscape, in spite of centuries of developing scientific knowledge, logic, Anal analysis, abstract technological thought, because I think human beings are not rational in that sense. They are a-rational, and by that I do not mean irrational. <laughs> that means by being a-rational, they have that extra dimension, which is why I think cul uh, all cultures develop the arts. Now, of course, architecture plays a key role in everything I'm saying because as, it, as I said earlier, it communicates in how it puts things together. And you know, again, is it more communicating humility or power or whatever you want to talk about? Now, the architecture that in my mind that would evolve from this sort of collaborative exercise I'm talking, collaborative thinking, would harness these collective intelligences because collectively rather than in the silo we know more than just in the silo and of course everybody knows that architecture is a canopy it sort of is the element that covers three-dimensional space it's an envelope all of these things we know uh, but this other approach the collective approach means that nobody's particularly in charge so much of the stuff I've done with cities over the years, there was always the transport planner or someone who was defining everything and saying, the rules are like this, and this has got to be nine meters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so their rules shape the vision rather than the vision of the planet B shaping the future rules, which is back to incentives and regulations. So done without sensitivity, that architecture, that building, that road building, feels as if it's foisting itself on you and it jars and it draws you inward and has no generosity of spirit. By contrast, when it's different and sensitive and understands place and understands place attachment, one of the most important things for human beings, because it's about then and responds and triggers to their sense of wanting to, their sense of longing and belonging. So that understanding of place, of course, is being aware of the people who live there and how they might want to live in the future, all of these things you know. And it's about making, shaping, and co-creating that evolving place. Obviously more difficult to do than just say, OK, guys, here's the plan, off we go. I appreciate that. But nevertheless, we used the word resilience a minute ago, that process, I believe, is more likely to be resilient. 
And one of the interesting things I think about architecture and building and all of these things is obviously what it does and what it leaves alone. Because the unsaid says so many things too. And I really like the unsaid because that actually has an incredible vibrancy to it. So of course you, many of you, are architects and know much more about it than me. You know, are the materials used, the uh, aesthetic forms, are they more sensuous or less sensuous? Is their knowledge of the culture of the place embedded in how the forms work? And again, always this question of what messages it wants to uh, project. And is the message one big building or a hundred small things done well? And I increasingly think a hundred small things done well and orchestrated are far more iconic than the big thing that imposes itself on you. So what I think I'm saying is that great placemaking is not a formula. It's a sort of combination between art and science. But strong principles can help us along the way. And I always use the phrase to be strategically principled and tactically flexible. So the strategic principles of any city development might, might be very simple. You know them all already. One of them we just heard a minute. We're in the sustainability pavilion here. That's one. But it could be acknowledgment of our diversities. It could be other things. But these are non-negotiable. You always know that you can hold yourself onto that. But you are tactically flexible. You're tactically flexible because you know circumstances change and how to get there. So we need to rethink the rule systems, how they're written. And I'm not going to talk about my latest obsession, which is the creative bureaucracy, which is all about this, where we run a festival on rethinking how all of these rules can be done, that within the rigidity we need to some extent, the predictability, how at the same time we can be agile and flexible. But as you know, some places disappoint. I actually think most places disappoint, and it's a real bore. I wish they didn't disappoint me. I wish I loved them. I wish I loved most places, but unfortunately I don't. But others, those occasional places, make us feel good. The ones I don't like close me in. They make my tribal instincts come more to the fore. I sort of close off. Whereas the places I like, which have those elements you mentioned before of safety, ease, and so on, I open out. I'm willing to connect. I'm willing to be more sociable. I'm willing to give more of myself. I'm willing to be more generous than I was before. So I've thought about things for quite a while because, sorry, I mean, we all have. Sorry, I'm not, not only me. We've all thought about things for quite a while. But in that thinking for a while, I, I really feel that when it's the places I don't like, they feel fragmented. They feel overwhelmed, overwhelming. I feel out of control. And that is the thing that does that process of drawing one in. And what I'm really interested in is myself opening out. So I've pondered on this. And there are five sort of key things I just want to mention. They may be relevant to you, I don't know. But anyway, the five key things that I think make great livable places are, firstly, places, places of anchorage and distinctiveness, places of connection and communication, places of ambition of an opportunity, places of nurture and nourishment, places of aspiration and imagination. So if we take the first places of anchorage and distinctiveness, what is this place like? And of course, the physical and the, all of your disciplines help in creating this. It feels like home. It feels like home. It generates a sense of the known, the familiar, the comforting, because I want to be comforted in where I am. It feels safe. I'm sheltered. Obviously, I have that sense of belonging. But it celebrates, too, where it comes from and acknowledges its past, its heritage, and all of those things, its traditions, and the core assumptions about who it is. It's not about nostalgia, by the way, but it just acknowledges 
that which exists are multiple identities. The more you explore us all, we're also multiple. I mean, you wouldn't know that I'm three countries actually at the same time, you know. I've got zero British blood just in passing, so you know. Um, but anyway, all of those things are etched into, of course, how a place is made and what it is. So this place explains to itself where it comes from in all the ways we know, the built fabric, the history and so on, its urban design, its rituals and behaviors, the routines of daily life that seem so ordinary, but a mass of the ordinariness is sometimes incredibly extraordinary in its ordinariness. And so I really love that. And that makes us, I feel, believe, feel rooted. And in that rootedness, we feel more at ease. And when we feel at ease and we go with the grain of culture, we're more likely to want to innovate. And that is the paradox. When you feel at ease with yourself, you're willing to change. And therefore, this is not about nostalgia. It's about innovation and tradition at the same time. The second key theme is this notion of connection and communication. Everybody knows about that. These places are places of relationship. Your map was beautiful. It's exactly that map, which I'm trying to describe in words, which is relationships from the incidental, the casual, the, the more profound, the deep ones, all of those forms of connections, neighbors and so on, and particularly people who are different from you. And also in this place, you link obviously physically in the place, but virtually to the wider world. And, but you're locally bonded. And I think this place is really against polarizing narratives. And this, I suppose, this seamless connectivity enabled through everything I'm talking about, obviously is helped by high quality design, good gathering places, all of those things, and walkability is obviously one of the key features. Uh, you can go from A to B rather than always having to drive to a destination where you might walk and then drive back. Anyway, this is the hub from which you connect to the wider world. This leads me to the third point, which is places of opportunity and ambition. So this place fosters open-mindedness. It's a culture, it has a culture of curiosity from which imagination, creativity, and all these other things might involve. And it gives you options for the different phases of your life. It has a can-do attitude. And some places provide that, of course, as we know, and others less so. But it does allow you the good place to explore your exploratory interests. And the materials you use for that, those raw materials, to leaving aside your own potential, creative potential, are things. And these things are physical things, but they're also symbolic things. There's obviously the repertoire of local products that could be reinvented if necessary. There's obviously the industrial heritage, historical, all of that stuff. All of these artistic assets too. This is all part of that. But it's also the indigenous traditions and all of these raw materials that can be used in various ways, rethought of. And this again draws us to the distinctive inner place, what it is, what's special, and so on. And I think when these features begin to unfold, it gives you a sense and a desire, a wish to want to perhaps give back. And that's all about then civic pride, loyalty, trust, and all of those things. Then we come to the thing which is, I believe, the fourth pillar, if we can call them pillars, nurture and nourishment, a place of nurture and nourishment, which is essentially our pavilion here. I hope it nurtures us. And this is a place where people can flourish, obviously. They can become the best they can be. They can self-improve through formal, informal learning. There's a discussion culture. There are things like this event happening in this place. We're widening horizon. But this place cares about every aspect of your life, this learning aspect I'm focusing on for the moment. But it also provides ladders of opportunity, mobility, mobility in the sense of getting rid of constraints and things like that and obstacles. And it therefore enables you to obviously feel more fulfilled. And you're fed by these broadening horizons of possibility. But to make all of this happens, 
happen needs some fundamental facilities, education, healthcare, affordable housing, social provision, all of these really important things, good parks, good retailing, good cultural activities, and so on and so on. But these facilities, I think, need to range not only from the large, which we see so often, but also to the intimate, which then helps that closeness that we want. So I suppose what I'm saying up till now is overriding everything is a sort of spirit of generosity, because I think that generosity, you know, if someone is generous to you, it's actually amazing, full stop. That's all I can say. So that leads me to my final, uh, uh, final point, which is a place, this is a place of imagination and inspiration. And what I mean by that is it obviously has a visionary feel in some sense. You feel at one with yourself, this notion of feeling whole again, but it provides you with a heightened level of experience. I think we hanker after this extra level of experience beyond the day-to-day -day that we always have. And that heightened level of experience might be, some people might call it beauty. We can, of course, argue endlessly of what is beauty and what is not. doesn't matter. At least we're having a discussion. And here, this visionary feel is made visible in the physical fabric. You can read it from the physical fabric. It tells you the story because you're seeing it. You don't need to have some sign with a, telling you the words. You just can immediately experience. But this visionary dimension would, should, nowadays, of course, have a massive ethical framework. And that has to reflect, and the physical has to reflect, the ethics the city wants to project. And obviously, these, I believe, are beyond self-interest. And the three, I'll just highlight for the moment, the one we've already discussed, which is obviously to do with climate and the issues related to that, and the division between the city and nature. Secondly, imaginatively working through how we live together in all of our differences. And third, how we unleash the creative potential in all of us. And one, I suppose, if I'm sloganizing, I would say it's better to be the most creative city for the world rather than in the world. The difference between for and in is so dramatic that any master plan, I haven't talked about master planning, the master planning I'm talking about has these principles and is flexible. But that difference between creative for the world rather than the most creative place in the world is important to me. So finally, what triggers transformation? If I just think it through from my own perspective, there are four things. I believe concepts, which sound abstract, are incredibly important. Club of Rome introduced more heavily the notion of sustainability. That did change, we argue about it and all of that, how we perceive things, that shifted our mind. Another more recent one is obviously uh, resilience. A third is gender equality. There are many more which you can call concepts. They frame things, they frame the mode of operation. But actually prior to that, what tends to trigger things is crisis. When you look at the crisis that just happened, so many impossible things became possible. I mean, I don't need to give you the examples from across the world where things suddenly, yes, we'll do it this way. So perhaps crisis is the first, and then that helps the concept that felt a bit dull and abstract come to life. And then you clearly need some sort of mission. Mission, mission, goal, aim, ambition, whatever you want to call it, intent, these words. And when you have urgency and crisis and a concept, Sometimes that can come together incredibly well because you begin to bring the different parties together, the different actors, and perhaps those actors that are very self-interested, and the reason we're not getting to where we want to be is some people are too self-interested, too many interests, but those can bring those things together. And that mission can be very simple. Back to the point, these are non-negotiable things. But perhaps most importantly, we need the lived project.
Because unless you've got the lived project that you are experiencing in your daily life and it is there, you get it. You get it in one. The signals are telling you it. You get it in one. And only later you might ask, well, how did they do it? But at least you've got it. So the lived project is important. So, for example, the whole notion for the moment of the 15-minute city, Maya Hidalgo, Paris, that many people are comp copying. There are many elements of that which are very good. I'm using that just as one example of a lived project, which is happening. It's not just an idea. Because when I think and reflect on everything I've heard over the last years, there is the impatience. It really is about walking the talk. And it's not only about the aspiration stuff. It's also feeling really strong about the obstacles. And, but I want to end on a positive note, not all obstacles. I think the creative city notion is really about a half glass full approach, isn't it? So what I'm leaving you with, in my own sense, that rather than feeling down about it all, I'd prefer to feel a tiny bit up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles Landry, for giving us a lot to think about. Next, I would like to introduce our three case studies that will proceed with the Q&A session. So please have your questions ready to allow for an equal dialogue. I believe that members and audience uh, can also be uh, on stage based on your experience and expertise and um, uh, thought process. So, we would like to engage in that dialogue after the case studies. I will start with BART Studio, consisting of Rupali Gupte and Prasad Shetty, uh, which is a multidisciplinary urbanist practice based in, in Mumbai. They will be exploring their hypothesis around small forces, uh, which has emerged la largely from their fieldwork. The concept discusses cities as composites of small forces of energetic selves. And those energetic selves also express themselves in everyday friendships and compassions and um, other daily uh, aspects of city life, which they will be presenting. Uh, these practices go beyond the acts of routine and are considered unproductive in generating grand conceptualizations of cities. They're often discarded as stray individual preoccupations, anecdotes, or subjective obsessions. Stephen Hobbs uh, will then continue. Uh, he will be presenting case studies from his collaborative practice, uh, the Trinity Session, a contemporary art practice based in Johannesburg, uh, which uses public art as a mechanism for research, dialogue, and placemaking. And finally, civil architecture will close with their case study, um, which is a cultural practice uh, led by Hamad Buhamsin and Ali Karimi. They will be exploring the role of water channels and springs in Bahrain and the Gulf, and the roles these channels play in planning, farm plot distribution, and the countryside. This will expand into thinking about how understanding this rural agricultural master plan can be used for contemporary projects, uh, using the case study of Riyadh Park as an example as well. So, um, Rupali, I'll welcome you to the stage. Thank you so much, Wilma, for this generous introduction. Um, so, so we are a collective, and what I'm going to do is I'll present um, the project here or the discussion, and Prasad will join in the question and answer session later. I hope there's a discussion for you. Um, so, so this this talk actually comes from uh, our 
discussions on cities that we've been sort of okay i'm going to move up ahead because it's blinding me a bit um so this discussion in, of cities that we've been involved in for the last 15 years uh and in some ways we've found the need to in some ways recalibrate the way we've been imagining cities we've been thinking of cities um so what we have been arguing uh is that cities have been thought of through certain tools there's the kind of limited tools to understand cities and that's maps statistics and standards and we believe that these are these tools are not adequate to understand life and and living as we understand it um and so what we instead propose is to think of cities through small forces uh, small forces that are kind of constituting the city uh, but in some ways i mean it's kind of larger exposition so what we're presenting right now is a smaller part of that exposition thinking of cities as large as small forces and what i'm going to present to you is three conceptual terms through which we think of cities the notes are from mumbai um, but for us i think it's also kind of important to think of these three conceptual terms through which we can largely think of the global south through uh so the first term is transactional capacities and so if you look at this this is a map of mumbai and what is it it's made of is series of of lines right lines that demarcate roads that demarcate plots um and and building boundaries but what you actually see as as a kind of hard line on the map when you go into the city when you go into the field and that's where a lot of our work is based uh you see that that line is not really kind of that thin hard crisp line but it's a corroded line it's a blurred line and you you see these layers that's the kind of the layers through which the city is made so you see that there is uh for example uh, a housing a uh, complex that's a chawl basically a series of tenements that are strung along a corridor you have uh, shops below you have these little extensions uh, the the thickness that sort of holds these what we call one foot shops because the property is only one foot deep uh, and also kind of constituted through series of kinship relationships uh, with the shops behind and then there's a row of hawkers in the front um, and also kind of row of of homeless who are who are in some ways take care of the wares um So this one is a is a is what is called the Pune Wala Chawl, and if you again look at it, this this is a single tenement, a two room tenement with a corridor in the front, a corridor at the back, but largely that house is a porous house. Um, so you'll see this. That's the the corridors in the front, and you always find a lot of furniture lying around. It's almost like orphan furniture because it's been lying around for so long that nobody knows who it belongs to, and in the sense it becomes a uh, you know property of the commons. and then those are those are bridges that connect the houses so you'll see a lot of people hanging around the bridges and uh in some ways becomes a living room of the place but what is interesting is that the urban form of that of that particular tenement is is kind of interesting because it's a porous tenement there's a door at the back there's a door in the front and and this old couple has been living in this house for years uh this old gentleman is ill for 3 years but again the possibility of of being in this place is because of the porosity of the house because they have series of people visiting them um and sort of walking in and out of that house um and a very interesting detail this at the back this is a kitchen cabinet that closes the door of the kitchen uh through the day and in the night that same door closes the the outside so that the the door sort of remains open through the day for people to kind of walk in and in some ways uh, it was interesting because it's kind of uh, the artist dushan had a door like this it's kind of a dual door that closes uh, two spaces at the same time and i think that was interesting to really kind of think of an everyday space that is made of this uh, a kind of detail like this and that's the house that's the the porous house that then kind of becomes part of the living room and the entire building then in some ways becomes one large house and again this is a self built settlement in bandra in mumbai um and again if you look at the layers that you saw uh, horizontally now they are vertical here you have a grocery shop you have a embroidery unit a workers dorm uh, the owner lives there at the back you have a place that rents out large utensils to make biryani for festivals because you can't keep those they're so large you can't keep them in your houses and then another embroidery unit a library a prayer hall and a community space all together in this one space as opposed to that you'll see these which are resettlement colonies that have 
you know, that kind of boxed off, closed off, and very few transactions that you saw happening earlier happening now in this place. The same place is resettled in, in these uh, areas. Um, and so you'll see that chawl that you saw would be rehoused into something like this, uh, parking for the first seven stories, and then this, this building above, and then, yeah, these, these tenements that you saw. Uh, but so, so this is where we come to the term transactional capacities, and this is what we argue that from the incremental settlement to the skyscraping apartments, uh, it's really what is high on this axis is transactional capacities, which could be defined as densities, number of activities, networks, transactions, care, livelihood, cultural setting, uh, the, the security that you get here, accommodation of diversity, uh, and also imaginations. And on the other axis, of course, it's the resources which are very, very high. But what is also kind of reducing is the, the blur, the corrosion that you saw in the first case you're getting. The boundaries are hardening and, and polarities are increasing on the other axis. And so with that, we come to this other term, transactional objects, which is in some ways a subset of, of transactional capacities. And you'll see the, this vendor in, in Charkop in Mumbai, she sort of replaced the, the compound wall, the fence with her shop there. Um, and then again, this as a transactional object. Um, and then this is the one foot shop with one foot inside and one foot outside the city, or then the shop within a shop, uh, completely impossible to think of it in cartographic terms, because how would you, you know, have a demarcated GIS boundary for something like that, where you have clear attributes of who owns what, um, and then a, a shop under the staircase, or then the one foot shop, so, uh, and then and a covered shop. Um, so when we were invited to the uh, 56th Venice Biennale by uh, Okwi Envisa uh, to think of a kind of propositional idea of thinking of the, of the futures of the world, of all the world's futures, uh, what we presented was to kind of look at transactional spaces, transactional objects around you, and speculate on the next step that the transactional objects would take in the city. And so the future is not something that is out there, but it's, it's kind of the next step that uh, the transactional spaces take. Um, and so in that sense, you kind of move into, you know, you see that the one foot shop was also a kind of day, a day and night one foot shop. So when the day shop closes, the night shop, the shutter takes over. Uh, so we kind of designed the space, which was a six inch day shop and a six inch night shop. Um, and then this the shop which s touches the city at only one point uh, and occupies very little city space. So there was this kind of idea of, of the pokey sphere which touches again the city at two points but can be rolled away when there is a raid. Um, or then this kind of uh, box, you know, these kind of box shops that are located at, at the corners of uh, cities where uh, these box shops are advertising the wares of plumbing and carpentry. So we designed this kind of accompaniment to it, a toolbox that kind of would perch itself with it. Or then people occupying cities at, you know, at another transcendental plane. So you see that this gentleman on the, on the left is kind of sitting on a high stu stool and the sit there's a kind of construction work going on underneath it, almost oblivious of what's going on underneath. So we designed this kind of astrologer's chair which you could sit on top and, and watch the city go by. So in some ways, these are propositional kind of, you know, uh, ways, provocations to think of cities through the bench ladder, which becomes the bench. Um, it's a ladder through to the day, and then in the evening becomes a bench for, you know, to kind of participate with the rest of your community. Um, or then the yeah, staircase shop or the basket shop, because the basket was this only place thing that uh, the in the inner city you have porters walking around with baskets and that's the only thing you have. Uh, you also use that to sleep in the night uh, or in the, in the day. Um, and so we made this basket shop uh, bed, which kind of is slightly larger than what was there and in some ways becomes this transactional space. Um, and so in that sense, kind of, you know, arguing for the fact that you, you think of city spaces and their transactional capacities, and in terms of engaging th with them, you kind of think of what is, how do you increase the transactional capacity? You know, what is the next step that this, these spaces take? And so with that, I'll come to the next term, settling. Um, and again, coming back to that first image that, uh, you know, to kind of really think of the fact that city is not a project. Uh, city is made with slow settling of series of relationships that get built uh, between people. So when an infrastructure project is built like this, it's built generally for efficiency to move from point A to point B. 
Um, and so, but you start seeing people settle uh, and occupy spaces in very different ways. So the, the kind of stair, the space under the staircase gets used, or then there's a picnic that is happening on the on the fly the skywalk. Or then this infrastructure project, which is which came from a slum sanitation project involving the World Bank, the municipal, uh, municipality. Um, but what happens is that again, it's a it's a project which is all the ticks on a uh, you know on a project report, you know investment, foreign capital sort of moving in. You've done all your job of you know ticking the right uh, boxes. But if you go on the ground again, a lot of this infrastructure fails completely because it's difficult to sustain it. On the other hand, the, something else is happening. There's uh, the lower level municipal officials actually kind of work in uh, ways in which, you know, they, there's no stakes really uh, and, and no kind of uh, capital to kind of participate in. But what they instead do is they work with the lower level contractors on the ground. Um, and what the, in this particular case, what they've done is they've laid a, a sanitation pipe um, which doesn't look like you've done anything, but in the long run, it's kind of it goes to the particular houses and people invest in their own toilets themselves. Uh, completely non-standard in some ways because it's you have this little staircase that goes up. There's a toilet on the top uh, in this on, in one of the balconies, um, and it works, but it doesn't tick any of those boxes that you begin with. Um, and so here, the, the, some of the houses were so small that it was not possible to have the toilet inside the house. So the community got together and, and allocated places outside on the street, which would then kind of be allocated to that particular house. Um, and yeah, so that's one of the houses, keeps consolidating slowly. Uh, the kitchen space kind of gave way for uh, the toilet to come and sit within it, and then the space outside you know, slowly grows into a garden and kind of consolidates and settles. Um, and that brings me to the last term, trips and kicks. And that's a, another proposition to think of the fact that city is made of small forces of several energetic selves. Um, so this is uh, a landlord who has rented one of the one foot shops and because he has nothing else to do, he hangs around with people here. And again, that's something that is important to understand, that people enjoy cities. We often don't think of the fact that people enjoy cities. Enjoyment generally happens in consumptive ways. Um, so how do we actually then think of trips and kicks and energetic selves that kind of make cities? Uh, or this one in, in Lamington Drone in an electronic cluster in Mumbai. Uh, LED, he kind of uh, had a shop of LED lights, uh, which he had taken over from his father, who was a tailor who ran the same uh, place. Um, and then he was kind of fascinated by uh, this Bollywood star uh, who kind of wore this light suit and, and had this, this, this musical. And he sort of got his father to stitch himself uh, a light suit and he would walk around Lamington Road wearing that light suit. Uh, so again, this is somebody who has a trip and cake. And then this one is uh, Pradeep, again in, in the electronic cluster of Mumbai. And he's a repair technician. But what is happening now with the global market is that uh, this, the parts of the, uh, the, the components are becoming smaller and smaller, and it's difficult for him to repair them anymore. Um, so he kind of what he does instead is he subdivides his shop. There's the shop that he retains for himself. The other part he gave, gives away to um, for a warehouse to some of his friends. And then he has this little blackboard on one of the shutters where he does this math and he tells us, you know, there's this gentleman who visited him and, and showed him how he was such a fool to retain that shop in that place, which was, you know, really r high real estate now. But he says, you know, what can I do if I sell this off? Because, you know, this is what I enjoy doing. And again, that's where we come to this, this fact that people enjoy cities and occupy cities in that kind of uh, act of enjoyment. Um, and so that, that extra time that he has when he's not repairing, uh, where his business is kind of dwindling, he does all kinds of other things. He starts tinkering with um, the, his chair. He says, you know, he makes this backrest for the chair and he says, it's ergonomically the, the most comfortable chair ever. Or then this geriatric friendly watch where there's a contrast of, the, of black and white. And he says, you know, why, doesn't pe why don't people really think of designing for the old? Or then this pen, uh, which is, you know, this kind of piece of acrylic that is bent and tied. And, and he says this is a pen in disguise because generally when he goes to the bank, people steal his pens. So he says, you know, I make this pen which people don't know is a pen. Um, and then, yeah, he goes on. So that just that kind of brings me to the last, um, you know, uh, proposition where 
we've been exploring with the idea of, of small forces, transactional capacities, trips and kicks. Uh, how do you mobilize them in some ways? Um, so we were invited to this, uh, the, the Urban Future Initiatives, uh, thinking of the future of urban mobility in 2030. And so what we said is that urban mobility cannot be understood as transportation and future cannot be thought of as singular. So instead, what we do is think of tools that you can kind of make for people to engage with their futures, you know, series of transactional uh, tools through which you can engage. So then we started looking at the city and we said, you know, if these are the, the many conditions of the city, then each condition can have its own future. So we started mapping this kind of glossary of, of conditions and, and ways in which the kind of various geographies were transforming. And then we said, you know, within these kind of conditions, there is also certain patterns that are emerging. And so we started drawing those patterns and we said we found, you know, broadly four patterns. We, one was the, the pattern of, of a trajectory of high polarization, like we saw before, right? That things were, the blur was reducing, uh, the boundaries of, of kind of separation, social boundaries were increasing. And that's what you saw the, the kind of, you know, the geography uh, that we saw before. The second pattern was the trajectory of economic restructuring. Um, so wh while commerce, finance in some ways was going down, what was kind of going up was the, cu the cultural space, the cultural industry. And, uh, and also this uh, industry that kind of uh, dealt with the old uh, was emerging. The third was a trajectory of, of intensification of environmental concerns. But what was interesting is that it was also in some ways a uh, kind of entrepreneurial space that people were engaging in. Um, and then the fourth was the trajectory of old age because you know it was becoming a city of the old, um, you know, and of course statistics that showed that. And so it was a city of many futures. Um, and so what we you know kind of to sum up, we said you know it was the urban form, uh, the transactional capacity was reducing, polarization increasing in terms of economy. It was the finance and BPOs that were reducing, culture and environment were kind of rising, um, environmental concerns rising, and in terms of democracy, you had demography, you had the average age increasing. Um, so so then we said okay, how do we kind of work with then? You know, thinking of the city as as a froth of of multiple, uh, you know, overlapping ecosystems, kind of relationships, kinships, claims, information, and then we started saying, you know, we we designed tools then tools to blur social and physical edges, um, you know, to kind of facilitate transactions, tools to create opportunities. Uh, economic opportunities, tools to engage with the environmental crisis, and and to kind of help the old live in dignity. So series of catalogs, catalogs of new enterprise, catalogs for en enterprise paraphernalia, catalog for greening vertical neighborhoods, um, you know, catalogs for starting to look at uh, the the kind of infrastructure and and tweaking it, uh, retrofitting it, senior city catalogs, retrofitting old settlements. And then just kind of bringing, we have just one, two minutes left, so I'll kind of just talk about a small little kind of subset of uh, something like this. We were, we looked, we, uh, we retrofitted a little space in a resettlement colony, the same one that you saw before. Again, mobilizing small forces, transactional capacities, settling trips and kicks. That's the resettlement colony. Um, and what was happening is that over the last, uh, you know, 15 years, uh, this place when it started was a place of very, very high alienation because people were dumped into it from all kinds of places. Um, but people, it, people had started consolidating and settling. So you see that yellow light there was an infrastructure project that was, you know, of course it was a road, uh, but people had started to occupy it in, in interesting ways. Um, also taking up few, you know, two, uh, two, two uh, houses, uh, which was not designed for any kind of infrastructure, but then people would make, you know, other things out of it. Uh, so what we did is we kind of uh, worked with this shed, which people had already claimed and and started to kind of settle it. Would it had dilapidated over time? Um, so and these were all the people who were involved in settling the place. Um, so we kind of said, you know, what we'll do is we'll take it to the next step. So that was the place that we retrofitted, a completely open scripted place, a multi-purpose place, a library that was crowdsourced. Yeah. And like, and it was called R&R, &R, uh, Rehabilitation and Resettlement, um, a take on it, you know, rock and roll and read and relax and all kinds of things happened there. Um, 
So I'll just run through the images. A completely camouflaged place from the outside, but this sort of buoyant roof with this yellow light that we saw before now also infiltrating this place. So, yeah. Uh, trans furniture, which was transactional, it could be used as railings, it could be taken away, taken over in different places. So, yeah. That's it. Thank you. Okay, I have, the, I have the challenging task of pushing an arrow here and, uh, and, a, and an arrow button over here, so it's going to be an interesting juggle, I think. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Stephen Hobbs, uh, co-director of the Trinity session. Um, and I suppose I should set the slides up. Do we have, I beg your pardon, this is exactly what I was concerned about. <laughs> All right. So. Um, we formed our collective, the Trinity Session, in 2001 as a, as a response to um, what seemed to be a kind of collapse in the infrastructure of the art world in Johannesburg. Gallery systems, um, museums, and so forth were virtually non-existent by that stage, despite the fact that post-94 we were being radically received, received on the global stage um, as, the, as, as the world perceived us as this incredible rainbow nation. So Marcus Newstetter, Catherine Smith, and myself um, looked to self-organization as a mechanism for um, trying to reimagine how we might um, sustain ourselves going into the future. Here we go. So who, why, what, a brief overview of the Trinity session. Um, so I think this is, I mean, from a, from a self-organization point of view, I suppose it was very important for us to uh, have some kind of positioning statement. And really our concern has always been to look at um, how Johannesburg functions post-apartheid as an, as, as an increasingly um, redefined African city. And this space became very, very interesting for us. Um, also enjoying, uh, or in terms of our own practice, an increasing visibility on an international stage. And so we found constantly that with every encounter that uh, we had internationally, Johannesburg seemed to be the place through which we interpreted those, those environments. It was a sense that the post-apartheid city condition um, in Johannesburg contained so many problems that resonated on a, on a, on a global level. Um, now, now, in the business of trying to understand how we might make a living in all of this, we found ourselves talking to city, um, city, city makers, planners, and particularly the, the Department of Arts and Culture, which became very robust as of uh, the mid-2000s. And we found ourselves um, almost operating at a consultative level, offering our artistic solutions, perhaps, and modes of communication to such territories as public art strategy, commissioning and implementation, looking at ways of commissioning, looking at um, uh, and supplying creative development projects and so forth. And I think that um, this was a really interesting space for us to work in because it brought us into, I suppose, the coalface coal face of city planning, city making, and policy. And through our ability, perhaps, to help translate some of the challenges that city uh, city makers had around reimagining various districts within the city. Um, the role of permanent and temporary interventions might help to galvanize new identities for new parts of the city. Now, in parallel to all of that, um, we, we uh, have our own interest in our own practices. So we function as solo, solo artists, but the collectivity or the conversation between uh, two, three people uh, elicits a really, really interesting dynamic in terms of imagining, pardon, in terms of uh, imagining ways of making work. So in these three examples, which span the first 10 years of our, of our work, um, it's everything from working within gallery spaces to working in the public realm uh, with temporary interventions such as building projections and so forth, and then doing more kind of 
almost silly performative works that are about our own sense of self-orientation or orientationalism and then trying to understand how we might translate that into an exhibition condition. And these projects are really important for us because they tend to operate at the, at the ephemeral and the temporary. And this is essential to, uh, an essential counterpoint, I think, to uh, um, the p more permanent stuff we were doing with the city of Johannesburg. So some ways of thinking and doing, and this goes back to the early days, but I think it's still incredibly relevant. We were really excited about cultural production within Johannesburg post-94 and really curious about understanding how we could visualize um, ideas about uh, the contemporary art world and where it sits, um, I'm just looking for the pointer here, where it might sit circa 2001. Um, exploring the idea of the network neighborhood, not only in terms of a local area network or a LAN, but how we are stronger through our partnerships and our connections. And we often used to um, accept invitations to exhibitions and set up mo a kind of mobile office, if you will, to kind of through a very performative manner and approach, make visible our creative process and then inst install screens and the like that started to get, we would map on and so forth and provoke a conversation around um, an artistic practice that didn't seem to be about objects. And then I suppose probably one of the most um, significant uh, uh, contributions to the way that we could imagine our industry and its um, uh, markets, if you will, was, ad uh, was adapting Charles Landry's value chain to a visual arts and crafts order of the SADC region. And this was really important for us because it helped us to think about our practice as business or the business of the practice and to imagine new, um, new avenues through which we might be able to articulate um, uh, the importance of a creative exchange and, and, and artistic language and so forth. So the title of my presentation is Reconnecting Special Places, Johannesburg Circa Now. And of course, the, the, the consequences of apartheid spatial planning such that communities were so segregated that the business of having to re-see re and reconnect uh, and cross-pollinate uh, is where I think some of the public art commissioning work has been really exciting for us because it has allowed us to visit our city and visit parts of the city that we didn't necessarily know about and, and re-find ourselves, let alone communities that typically um, uh, sort of remained less visible. So the project I'm going to um, focus on is our, our, our curatorship and coordination role of um, creative placemaking through art along the transit-oriented development corridors in Johannesburg. And that red line signifies the rear via bus rapid transit system through Johannesburg. So to the bottom, Noordgesig is a community just northeast of Soweto, and you see those yellow um, uh, footprints, if you will, are, is the remnants of the mining industry in Johannesburg. And then, of course, the red line takes its way all the way up to the, the rich suburb of Santon with the super poor suburb uh, or neighborhood Alexandra Township. Now, the green highlighted points are some of the neighborhoods that we were commissioned to work in and, and conceptualize or, re or understand how to explore this notion of placemaking through art. Now, what really catalyzed that uh, lens, if you will, was that at the time that we um, tended on this um, public art program in 2014, the city was referring to these transit corridors as the corridors of freedom because it was the vision of Parks Tau, the then ANC mayor, that reconnecting communities, suburbs, and neighborhoods was really the mission of the post-apartheid pr um, project and that this would be done through um, transit infrastructure. Now, there was a pause, excuse me, and there was a pause on the response to our, to our tender, and only in 2017 do we get, re get engaged and notified that we've been appointed, during which time Parks Tower has left um, the city and the DA, Democratic Alliance, has won the metro. And I, I, for political reasons and very good strategic reasons, Herman Mashaba, the then mayor of the city, was very, very concerned with 
why we should be referring to the city as a world-class African city when in fact there were so many problems to fix. Let's fix those problems and then imagine how we can become public facing again. So just the intervention of removing a world-class African city from the logo and just settling it back to Joburg meant that we could actually take a much more fine-grained approach to um, the, 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 the intervention, interventionist work that we were about to do and not kind of grandstand in terms of global city sort of rhetoric and so forth. So Art My Josie is born out of that. Josie is a nickname for Johannesburg, and through a conversation with our client, we, we, um, we came up with that title, which is a handle as well. So by all means, uh, follow us on Instagram and Twitter and so forth. Now, the transit corridors were really, during Parks Tower's time, um, re rethinking um, through the transformation agenda land strategies that would both look at um, heritage, uh, built heritage and how to preserve that while intensifying or densifying the corridors through affordable housing and the like. Um, looking at a branding and communication strategy which really worked well in terms of the, 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 the symbolism of the corridors of freedom. Infrastructure in terms of service delivery and so forth. And the area where we've been most um, uh, uh, preoccupied would be the social clusters and related programs. So, the identification of facilities that were um, specific to and, and necessary to those communities through a kind of process of co-production and, and exchange in order to identify the best, the best solution for that community's needs. Now, to just backtrack for a second, there is something very special about the history of the corridor. Some of you may, know that, may not know that Johannesburg essentially would not exist today were it not for the discovery of gold. And the road... That, that runs through Johannesburg's northern suburbs, namely Louis Buerta Avenue, which would have been that red line that extended up to Sandton, was in fact an important trade route in the 1850s where tribes from sub-Saharan Africa, the Ndebele in particular, would trade cattle, would literally come down, cross borders, and go to Pretoria, which was already established at that point, and trade their cattle. So there was already an African uh, footprint uh, on this then old Pretoria road. And we had the wonderful opportunity to kind of articulate what that history and narrative might um, have been and, and is today through a really ambitious mural project that we were commissioned to do by the uh, Department of Transport. So you see this ridiculous precast wall sitting on the right-hand side and transport coming to us and saying, this is a horror. What, how can we make the most of this thing? So the, the brief was really to re present in a really dynamic and accessible public way um, the history of transport through the city. And in summation, you kind of, you're looking at a 3,000 square meter um, painting, but what's really, really important, apart from the incredible participatory process with the artists and the six month lead around design, was, was, the, um, was the level of interactivity and the, and the mechanisms by which community could participate and actually make their mark on this, on this wall. So, the, the corridor is defined, were you to travel it, by the BRT stations. And we, as part of our contract, have the opportunity to adorn each of those stations, their glass and steel panels at the entrances with pieces of art. And so, uh, giving a layer of identity to the station and in some instances responding quite site specifically to the, the location and place of that, of that station. Now, the objective behind these, uh, uh, with these stations is that they offer microeconomic opportunity for the location that they're sited in and attendant to that, the, the, the creation of these social clusters. So very briefly, I'll just show you an example, um, namely Patterson Park in, in Johannesburg's northern leafy suburbs and some evidence of the sort of artistic intervention on the building, but what you have here is a mixed use a um, leisure facility, I suppose, with library, swimming pool, sports, sports and recreation, and all that kind of thing. But there's also a really important uh, and exciting heritage dimension to the site as well, which I won't go into here. Now, uh, and uh, further north, um, to, the, to the park side of Patterson Park, we did a far more sort of traditional piece of work where you have uh, these, this gateway sculpture, if you like, these three trees that commemorate the site of the original citrus farm in Johannesburg and repurposing a, a, a clearing of old fig trees, some hundred years old, into, uh, into park furniture. So, 
Noetgesig, um, and the placemaking program that took place there. So all of these sites that we've been working on started pretty much 2017 and moved through to 2020. Now, I see I'm running out of time, so I'm going to, I'm going to move quite quickly and probably pause midway through the, the presentation and end there. But just to contextualize, Noetgesig is essentially a one square kilometer township with approximately 50,000 colored people living it, mixed heritage. And to the, to the northern side, a small population of, of black people. Now, if we look at the upgrade area, which has all the letters on it, uh, in a way, it's a very simple program of entering and exiting or looping through um, this neighborhood uh, where we're introduced through kind of the upgrading of the road reserve and surfaces in the image in the middle, and then uh, uh, traveling up into the township and arriving at a public plaza and a really significant new, new building, uh, the Noorgesig Library. Now, after... Because of the scale of the township, the sort of personable nature of it, the, the walkability of it, and the, and the, and the porosity of, of, of that uh, fabric, one literally comes into contact with all generations of the neighborhood, and people are very quick when they see a group of white people walking around to either want to sort of push them to one side or say, come with me, I have a story to tell you. And this is what is significant about this neighborhood, I think because of its scale and its and it's homogeneity in a way, because you've got one, one cultural framework sitting in one place. And so the likes of um, Sister Betty Glover and um, Marvesta Smith um, became, uh, I suppose, symbolic um, leaders of thinking about how we might deal with the representation of history, memory, and important um, individuals in the community. So in the most simplistic way, the artworks program predominantly executed through murals that are underpinned by very specific social, political narratives lead you into uh, the upgrade area, take you up to those two circles where you have the, uh, the new plaza and the library, and then take you back down to New Canada Road. And the mechanism for procuring that work was really an intensive um, uh, process of social engagement where we would set up uh, a call to action, if you will, inviting people to audition and really just show their work. And we weren't asking for artists, we were just appealing to the, the, the resident base of the community so that we could start to not necessarily use language like art, like art to, to explore artistic representation, but to understand where creativity sat within the, the, the imagination of the community and where the, the, the skills to, within that community might influence an artistic program that is specific to the, the texture and vernacular of that, of that community. So we found ourselves, given the lack of traditional infrastructure to build and make things and present things and so forth, we worked very closely with pastors of makeshift churches and so forth and produced exhibitions and uh, environments that would allow the public or offer the public an opportunity to actually see what each other was doing and at the same time uh, provide the client with an opportunity to interact with the community as well as adjudicate the work, so to speak. And, and the communities themselves were actively involved in that adjudication process too, so that we had a kind of voting system, if you will, where, where not so much the voting being important, but that people could talk about the work itself. And that was really important. Not so much an educational process, but maybe part that and part ownership or creating ownership. So there are a, a, a tremendous number of narratives that manifested and helped us to kind of make, use the murals as an orientational mechanism. So the first thing you would see when you're traveling up New Canada Road towards Soweto would be this mural representing a time when there was a forest in that place. So this is the Forest View mural. And because the Nordgesig community still um, struggles with the fact that um, they weren't represented on apartheid spatial planning maps for a very long time and essentially kind of were erased. The, the business of building up the community and the term that came out of that, bilte, which is the sort of vernacular for um, uh, re, re, re-seeing itself, is, a, is an important gateway marker into the upgrade area. And Sister Glover is commemorated on the Baptist Church as you go up Colin Drive. And walking the city, we found, or walking the neighborhood, we found this connector, if you will, between Collin Drive and um, North Street that the urban designers didn't seem to 
think was that important, but for us was really, really um, uh, strategic in terms of one, upgrading the, 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 that particular stretch of, I beg your pardon, I haven't been moving, there we go. So this is the, the, the corridor link. And the conversation that took place with the community around saying, well, look, we want to use this as a mechanism to connect the upgrade area and the artworks program and really tell a bit of a story of Nuit Gesuch specifically for the benefit of the primary users, which are kids coming home from school. So this was a shortcut for them to get into the neighborhood. And the conversation that took place, um, just interacting with residents, asking permission to demolish walls in order to then rebuild them and produce a better piece of infrastructure and so forth, was really a, a very intimate and dynamic exchange and felt like there was some level of giving back in that context. So some breakdown of the mural, its narratives, and the artists that were directly involved with their styles in, in, in the visualization of those stories. And we see more of it, the case of actually the sense that the neighborhood is very much an, an event neighborhood. People come out in their, in their Sunday best, go to church, or to go to um, uh, 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 weddings and so forth. And it's really a kind of dynamic a community on a Sunday in particular. Now, we were very, very... Uh, enticed by a meeting, or by our meeting with the, the biker collective, a dad and his two sons who have this fantastic approach to repurposing bicycles and Im imagining scenarios for furniture and so forth, and also providing a very necessary escape, if you will, for, for the kids in the community who are often very threatened by the sort of drug and, and viol violent kind of um, culture that does exist within the community. So the opportunity to work closely through mural and permission to repurpose their innovations and inventions into pieces of urban furniture was a real privilege and, and great opportunity. So I think um, I've spoken about Sister Betty Glover, and one of the things that was really, really fascinating about learning about her presence, apart from her being a spiritual woman and, and someone that the community really looked to for spiritual and religious guidance, was the fact that she introduced urban farming into the area and looked at food, food security and sustainability as, a, as, a, as an important part of that community's present and future thinking. And we see Sister Mary Glover, uh, Sister Betty Glover commemorated in a range of wraparound murals in local what we call spaza shops or general dealerships uh, that face onto the upgrade area. And I'm pretty much moving towards the end now, so if you can indulge me for another minute, that would be lovely. We heard through our walkabouts and our interactions with um, particularly the senior residents of this myth of the, of the long table. And after, and after numerous oral histories, um, meetings and conversations and recordings, we got into the company of the Mal Malchas family's home where we in fact saw this long table, which is really just basically a kitchen table. But this table seemed to be so important within the kind of socio-political activist mindset of the community during the apartheid era because it would be taken out of the house and put into the public domain and there would be kind of public meetings that took place around it. So sort of domestic scale becomes politicized but community sort of building at the same time. So we, we, we prepared a very robust piece of furniture, spent a lot of time documenting um, the Malchus family's home, uh, the, the, the things that they would put on the table, the tablecloths, all that kind of stuff, and the sort of ritual, ritualization of that surface and its social function, and then try to imagine how the interior of the building might be translated on the exterior of the, of the piece of urban furniture. So you see some of the housing details are situated on the object itself. And this is, and this is now sits in proximity to the Nuit Gesuch Library. Now, I'm going to skip through because I am taking up more time. And I'm really just going to show a few images because the final point that I want to make, and I think this is, this is important just looking at this here. These are um, pieces of uh, play equipment, if you will, that were designed outdoors because we had nowhere else to make them, and this is where the crafters sat. So it was a very kind of public spectacle of creation to service a part of the library that really, uh, from a programmatic point of view, really excited us and I think the community, and that was the provision of a 24-hour safe space, if you will, within the library so that it would be accessible for people who really needed quiet time. I'm putting it pol pol um, politely. So there's more, more work that was created, and we find it manifesting in the library as we see here. And I want to end with this image. 
um, the left, Liana Stradom, our, our client within city development and, and planning, and uh, Yasmin Dinath to the, to the left of me. And I mentioned something about the, I think I mentioned something about the percent for art, public art policy that Johannesburg holds, and it's the only metro to have that policy, and it was instated in 2006. And up until Park, Parks Tower's time, it was really about big sculptures and sort of grandstanding as a city on a, on a, on a, a subcontinental level. But what was so interesting is how, through Herman Mashaba's intervention with the logo, and how that set off a, 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 a tone within the procurement process that were it not for the incredible um, leadership between Liana, Yasmin, and many others within the city, we might, not have actually, we might have just gone back to business as usual. So I think it's, a, it's an obvious one in many respects, but policies exist, but typically they, they can be reimagined and activated in radical ways if you have the right kind of radical people in, in holding office in that way. And I actually want to celebrate these two people because they've been exceptional in our experience of our practice. So with that, I would like to say thank you very much for your time. Fantastic. So uh, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, Abdel Munim, Dilma, and Aqua for inviting us here today uh, to be part of uh, the discussion on the dimensions of culture and community. Uh, it's a pleasure. So uh, we begin by introducing ourselves. I'm Hamid Bukhamsin and Ali Karimi. Uh, and uh, we work together on a series of pro uh, we'll be presenting a series of projects that we uh, have done in our practice civil architecture. Uh, which operates out of Bahrain and Kuwait. Uh, the practice attempts to leverage exhibitions, history, and cultural production uh, to counter the expediency that characterizes most of the architectural landscape uh, within the Gulf. Uh, our practice positions itself as a civil practice, uh, being that we both teach at, uh, uh, teach at public entities uh, within our respective countries, uh, and within that sense, we are civil servants. Uh, and that sense of responsibility extends to our practice. Uh, the aim of this lecture is to talk about the spaces within the Gulf that exist beyond the urban. We, uh, we will speak about the peripheral landscapes which make up the rural and the peri-urban areas that encircle and enable uh, the region's cities. So we begin by highlighting one of our first projects uh, that was commissioned as part of the Riwaq Art Fair in Manama, Bahrain, uh, titled Cheap Ecology. The project was fairly simple, an initial encounter with the leftover spaces of the region uh, triggered specifically by this image. Uh, this is a farm along Deya Highway, uh, lit up by floodlights. Uh, we found it to be quite beautiful, almost uh, entirely accidentally so. At first, we assumed it was simply a public park, lit up by the most cost-effective means. This actually uh, wasn't the case. And in fact, this was done, as a, uh, done so as a security measure uh, to prevent people from congregating within the dark space but it seemed to us so delightfully naive that the thought of it as a public park stuck with us. So uh, sites like these are fast fading from the Bahraini landscape. Uh, within the context of the Gulf, there is this general obsession, often not with nature, but its erosion. Uh, we find this somewhat problematic because it suggests that we are more concerned and interested in a source of anguish uh, than building new natures. Uh, or even really come to terms with what the idea of nature is other than uh, something that is depleting. This project was in some way an attempt to uh, figure out the role of design can play in uh, changing our perception of uh, the outlook of la landscape, particularly within the region. So as part of the Riwaq Art Fair prompt, uh, we had selected to create an installation uh, in Adliya that was formerly a large palm grove. Uh, when we proposed the, to use the site, and the area, we got told that there wasn't anything there specifically. Uh, and it was just an empty lot. But there, were, there was actually the remains of the, this palm garden that we want to kind of address. We were told nobody goes there. And, but in fact, people Skype their families from underneath the shades of the, of the palm fronds, and workers tend to hang out 
uh, all, there all the time. So in reference to the Bdeya, farm in Abdeya, uh, a floodlight and public seating were installed within the space. Floodlights uh, typically used to demarcate the inaccessible or surveil spaces for security uh, are now used on site to highlight the palm grove and invoke a dialogue in public space. Uh, by using the floodlights, uh, the, pro the proposal just doesn't uh, the proposal doesn't just point to the existing possibilities for green space to be used once more, but remediates the policed landscapes uh, of the country into moments of beauty through the use of cheap interventions as an alternate to infrastructure heavy parks. The goal of the proposal is simple. Uh, it is to begin a conversation of unsolicited landscapes, looking less to the build it that, uh, build it to uh, they will come approach, uh, build it and they will come approach to public parks and more the idea if you see it, uh, then it exists. Uh, within the space, a publication was made featuring a photo series highlighting the residual greenscapes of Bahrain. And we had held a series of events uh, that activated the space and became a working seminar of sorts, asking more questions about, uh, the, about similar spaces within the region. Cheap ecology would raise the questions that led us to look into the landscapes of the Gulf as sites of interest and potential, worthy of further study uh, of, as spaces of collectivization. So building off the questions from cheap ecology, we found ourselves looking for a way to think about the origin of these leftover spaces, these leftover landscapes, uh, their planning logic their, uh, and their origins in the region. Uh, as part of our participation as, uh, at the Oslo Architecture Triennale, uh, Triennale's theme of degrowth, we examined three examples of formal planning practices prior to the discovery of oil. The desert kites across the Arabian Peninsula, the fish traps of the Gulf, along the Gulf Coast, and the Qanat water systems of the agricultural areas prevalent throughout the peninsula, of course. The study attempts to establish an alternate canon from which to begin our understanding of the region. So within the peninsula, the narrative of the fossil fuel economy has overwritten previous traditions of landscape and territory. Uh, as a happy partner in, the transfer, in this transformation, architectural and urban discourse has predominantly centered around the integration of cities into the global economy, uh, reproducing a generic built environment as a form of global currency, uh, uh, effectively. In the case that architectural theory looks uh, for pre-oil uh, pre precedents within the region, uh, research then focuses primarily on the traditional homes, the mosques, and the study of urf, the heuristic uh, spatial practices of lo uh, local tribes that resulted in the clustering of courtyard home typologies. These cases are useful as architectural precedents, but less so for planning study of formal operation uh, and policy. They also offer little in uh, the way of organizing the territorial relationships between city as a place of trade and habitation, uh, and the productive rural urban landscapes that sustain city life. These precedents offer insights into the political dynamics of small towns, but provides few formal strategies beyond perhaps organic alleyways, and even fewer that have been applied by plan a planning body. So actually, prior to this. So the, this investigation of incremental urban accumulation in Gulf towns as a study of planning uh, is different from the word of planning, uh, planning in Arabic, which is tahtit, uh, or line making, the drawing of lines and applying, uh, applying them to land. The reality of the Gulf Mat city is that it, uh, its most legitimizing factor was that it was not planned. Rather, it was a product of various adjacency, adjacent families living under the auspices of tribal regimes uh, that granted autonomy to its inhabitants. So, however, when directing our attention to the landscapes of the region, we notice that the historic water channels of Arabia constitute the region's most extensive uh, collective infrastructure. The challenges posed by the, uh, living in a hot and arid climate with low rainfall, little drinkable water, necessitated a series of architectural and uh, ecological and social innovations that could sustain life. Uh, these came the form of plant systems of water conveyance from springs to farms. Millennia of reliance on these sources of water formed the basis of codes uh, to ensure equal rights among the community and uh, equitable use of natural resource. The springs constituted the public domain and stakeholders in the community that were responsible for maintaining them and their water channels uh, to sustain urban life, or urban slash rural life in this case. Uh, the larger springs were amongst 
uh, the earliest public spaces in the region. And, gender, and the gendered nature use of these also meant that the springs were assigned uh, separate hours for men and women to water. The channels of Arabia are a 2,000 year example of, non, of a non-urban past, which was planned, a studied, measured, and all-encompassing cosmology and social order of its own. It's not the organic Arab city that provides historical case studies on how to plan land, but the gridded and studied subdivision of farmlands and the organized construction of underground channels to serve distant territories. It is an argument for both maintaining an, alternate, uh, an alternative to the constructed scarcity of today's uh, property market and the idea of growth as a constant uh, reinforcement of this artificial scarcity, especially in the context where water and food is food scarcity again, is a very real and ever-present concern that the study of these farms is set against. So for the Oslo Architectural Triennale, uh, we had collaborated with a Bahraini textile designer uh, named Hale Kekso to create a representation of these territorial systems. The idea of tapestry was to canonize these formal strategies, uh, creating something similar to a carpet or a textile. However, then the, uh, however, instead of the typical representations of paradise that usually accompanies, uh, accompany these types of uh, rep forms of representation or a private gar uh, garden of a nut, this uh, tapestry was a non-idealized private landscape, uh, but instead a landscape of communal infrastructure and territorial planning. Rule, so in contrast to the laissez-faire practices of town making, these lines were drawn based on a, a priori configuration tested over thousands of years with a shared set of cultural and political planning uh, practices that govern uh, their construction and use. Rules over planting, hunting, water distribution, and even the careful land subdivision uh, reveal not an unplanned Gulf city, but rather a deliberate and painstaking application of planning as part of both formal and political processes. In this regard, the landscape of the Gulf is far more planned than its cities and its social structures far more urban. So the research from 2,000 years of non-urban history became the seed for a proposal we did recently for the Riyadh, uh, Riyadh municipality's Abu Makhroug transposition. Uh, so the mountain of Abu Makhroug was considered an important natural feature in Riyadh, used for centuries as a landmark on trade routes, marking the entry point or the exit point of Haj, uh, Hajar or Riyadh, uh, Riyadh's former name. So in the 1950s, with the opening of the government agencies in Riyadh as the capital of the uh, new Saudi state, or uh, Saudi state, a series of districts were planned around the old center. El Melez was one of the five districts built to provide housing for government employees, which also included a park around Abu Makhrouk, uh, which uh, opened in 1979 and was closed in 2012 uh, due to poor maintenance and neglect leading to the municipality to launch a competition for its revival. So, what we had proposed was, rather than restoring the terraces to a green urban condition, we argue what made Abu Makhroug interesting was that it was an urban mountain, uh, and that it offered an idea of leisure and rest that did not require greenery, simply the quiet and beauty that, the mountain, uh, that a mountain in the desert usually offers. The, uh, the proposal maintains Abu Makhroug's unique presence as a public park that is a topographic. For the area around the mountain, we recreate uh, a part of Riyadh's unique urban farming history. By subdividing the area into a series of plots for growing different produce, th this area is connected by a long shaded walkway which provides shade uh, with various programmatic elements like cafes and shops uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, interspersed between them are a series of groves for families and gatherings to congregate, acting more as a private palm garden for groups. So the remainder of the site is turned into a contemporary reimagining of a farm, retaining the subdivisions and planting that would have been present in the beginning of the 20th century, but taking on a new urban form. Rather than the, uh, that of the typical European park, the strategy of mixing shading, farming, uh, offers a new vision for the public parks in the 21st century Arabian city. The work done, uh, the work done also, also factored in a uh, large part in the planting choices. Uh, that, and the subdivisions, uh, and allowed us as an entry point to collaborate with a landscape architect, choose the planting, and identify the seasons and the argument of the design. 
So in contrast to the European or the American countryside, the landscape of the Arabian Peninsula forms itself around textures of rock and topography. It is more, uh, it is more of a cartographic entity, a spatial condition of nodes and markers that is a landscape. When it is productive, that productive landscape is what John Dixon Hunt would identify as the first, second, and third nature. One which is primal, uh, one which is productive, and one which is formal, decorative, and aesthetic. The productive landscapes are also spaces of recreation and relaxation by the very nature and the amount of effort it takes to sustain these landscapes. So these three products, uh, these three projects, sorry, are meant to show the process which we take in approaching architecture and uh, when we take to approaching architecture and landscape in the region, in the Gulf, beginning with a series of questions which drive, uh, drive us from one project to another. Um, Fueling exhibition work and design, the projects form a loose working manifesto uh, on the Gulf, which provides alternative, uh, alternative venue, avenues for architectural development and thought. And maybe on that note, I conclude here. Thank you. Joking earlier, I don't know how we ended up with such a male-dominated panel under my watch. Um, but uh, here we are. Rupali, we count on you. <laughs> You're still part of the conversation. Uh, thank you all for your uh, presentations and such uh, insightful perspectives. Uh, we would like to now invite audience um, to share, I mean, to ask questions because I think it's really important to allow for the dialogue, especially that you've been patient, uh, you've been listening to us for the past two hours, we would like to now hear uh, from you. So I assume that there's already, if you can raise your hand, whoever would like to ask a question, then we can uh, circulate the, the microphone. Who will be the most, uh, oh, here we have some, some brave ones. Hi. Is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you for those um, speeches um, and uh, presentations. Um, I was most interested by the interventions in, in Joburg um, and in, um, and in uh, Bahrain. What we, what we see is, it, uh, I think from a layperson's perspective, it almost feels as if there is an intellectual aspect that is taken to um, situations that arise in urban spaces. Um, I'm intrigued as to what happens afterwards. Um, is there a way of going and seeing whether these interventions actually helped? And is there a way of reviewing and perhaps changing um, some of these things down the line? Thank you. Thank you for this question. So, Stephen and Ali, would you like to attempt to answer this? Which mic is working? I and think that's for Ali. The handheld is for Ali. Yeah. Okay, um, I, that's a, that's that's always the key question. What what do you do once you once you've delivered the project? So I think that um, Sister Glover's um, the inspiration behind her her her, her growing projects, if you will, uh, became something that we took quite seriously um, during the the pandemic. We first of all, these projects are quite durational. I mean, it's unusual to work in a site with a public art agenda for three, four, five years. Typically, you go in within a year, you spend the money, and you get out, which is really kind of hostile in a way. And we've done a lot of that work. Um, it, so, so I recall having a conversation in the middle of last year with one of our participants who is now under our employ and saying, you know, Lavinia, do you, where does all this visualization of Mama Glover's work go? Are you yourself capable of growing your own food? Do you know how to do that and so forth? So really what has manifested has been a conversation with a series of small gardens within the community, um, facilitating and uh, empowering Lavinia to grow her own food and resourcing her 
the level that is appropriate to the scale of what she owns and, and can do, and getting her family and the community really involved as possible. And what we're starting to see is Lavinia's connecting of other small gardens and allotments in the spirit of Mama Glover's work is setting up a really interesting conversation, not in dialogue with the public art component, but more an idea about the spectacle of collective, creative, and generative work. And a small example of this would be, and I'll conclude shortly, is um, we have this fabulous moment in, in, in our winter period in, in the Northern Cape where the Namaqualand daisies flourish and it's, you just have fields of the most spectacular color. And the Nordgesicht community essentially is from that part of the world, the, the Namaqualand area and descendants of the Khoisan. So Lavinia tells us, uh, in win shows us pictures in la winter of last year how a, a member of the community had some seeds, Namaqualand daisy seeds, and so they decided to part plant a couple of, 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 of gardens with these things. And now you've got pictures of the kids playing and all this kind of stuff. So the introduction, one, of color, but two, the sort of event of growing and connecting the gardens in this tiny little township to this national, well, from an imagine, imaginative point of view, this national event that takes place in the Northern Cape has been for us a really unexpected mechanism for Im imagining how um, temporary interventions and collective practices might start to th rethink that sort of the performativity of that neighborhood and make connections back to what the art program is really about, which is a kind of orientationalism, I suppose, and a sense of identity and place. Maybe to touch, maybe to touch upon the Bahrain part, um, I think for us, the whole exhibition was about figuring out what success means, and I think particularly in the case of the Gulf, and even more so in, in the idea of public space, success and failure mean completely different things to different communities. So, for example, when we had pitched that space, everyone on the position of the, the kind of the art entity, Rawak, said no one goes there, and it's, there's no reason to put something so far away. But we found that actually there were workers there almost every night, especially in that area, because it's all restaurants. So they'd leave out their shifts or they'd be in, in kind of these breaks and they'd go smoke and scrap their families in between. And when we put the floodlight, Bahraini would start going uh, because it was now brightly lit, the seats were kind of clear and you also could park near there and say, oh, I'd leave my stuff in my car, I'd be fine. So the workers who would go there suddenly stopped going. So on one hand, it became successful for the duration of the art event, but a failure for the community that were there before. And as soon as the art event w ended, we had picked the, moving those benches because we knew no one would move them again, uh, which is because of all the sand and you could, you'd get a forklift stuck there. So the light was removed, but the benches stayed. And so now, even as, as far as a few months back, I sent Hamid a few photos and the workers have returned in kind of full force now that they have a place to sit because they know, oh, actually this place was now designed for us, um, making it somehow a failure again for the Bahraini community because no, no Bahrainis go hang out there but maybe a success to the community that now sees it as a kind of official space rather than a kind of leftover sidewalk. And so for us, this kind of extended observation has been the nicest thing because success and failure kind of ebb, ebb and flow and that chance to kind of observe something even after it's kind of lifeline and past the warranty has been really the subject of fascination because we realize, well, actually our metrics need to completely change and there could be different metrics for different times in different communities. Thank you for this. We have a couple more questions. Uh, uh, thank you for the for the wonderful presentation. My questions for Prasad and Rupali, and um, I thought that Rupali's presentation was really interesting because of how it unsettled a dominant binary of the old and new, which is often referred to with cities and city planning. You know. And this old and new binary, you can see how it operates by, you know, when places or neighborhoods become old, they need to be renewed. And if they're old, old means dilapidated, old can mean unsafe, old can also mean heritage and therefore reified and completely dysfunctional sometimes. So old gets into that and new gets into some kind of new technologies, new jobs, safety, surveillance, all of these things. And Rupali's presentation somehow just like pierce through that binary by bringing attention to um, to settling. So, um, um, and she also mentions how this, it was an interesting sort of statement when she said that the city is not a project. And you can see that this project idea about new and old, how that continues, right? So what I wanted to ask was that 
given this kind of polarity of old and new, which resists, I think, the idea of settling, what role do you, Prasad, um, see architects and urban planners perform in relation to settling? Because if all architectural projects are about either reifying or renewing or creating new projects, I mean, you can see many cities in the world that, um, in fact, resist the idea of settling. Things should not settle in too much, quickly change the change the fabric of the city or something, right? So the settling thing really complicates those, and I wonder how you see the role of architects and urban planners. I think, I think uh, um, it's, it's, the, it's the scale that you see it, you know, the time scale and the spatial scale. So, so, so you, I mean, how do you kind of, you know, think of, uh, uh, you know, like, like, like even if it is even if it is an ambitious large project, it will take its time to settle in. You know, it it will it will take its time to fold in because cities are not really these docile things where you can put something and something will change. It they, they will they will have to undergo a dialogical relationship and then they will slowly kind of you know make them. So, so that's why the city is not a project. It, it has to happen by itself. You know, cities happen; they're not made. The plans don't make them. So, so it's a, it's a, it's a way. So, so it's better that architects realize it. Not only architects, planners, and everybody else who thinks of you know doing. Something. What you do is you simply nudge a little bit, and you you are only nudging all the time. And sometimes the nudges work. Sometimes they don't. The point, however, is to figure out how to enjoy it. You know, how do you kind of how do you enjoy the process of nudging? What 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 happens to you and and to the city while this 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 nudging takes place? So I think I think so so that's so I'm not saying I'm not I'm not you know uh, uh, intending to sound uh, anti big or uh, uh, anti binary also because I think I think binaries. Uh, need to be mobilized in some places to kind of you know do certain things. But I think I think irrespective of what whatever you do, what, the, the cities have a way to kind of you know work work yourself out, work work things out for you. I think I think that that belief is something which is more important. Thank you for this, and I actually would like to um, reference something that I thought Stephen Hobbs mentioned that was very powerful: asking permission. Which is something I think connects very well to um, Sabi's question. And I would like to engage Charles in the conversation because in your keynote you said uh, most of the time rules shape the vision rather than the vision you know, that shapes the rules. Um, could you elaborate on this kind of as part of this dialogue and adding to the question from the audience? Um, and connecting it back to whose vision, right? Because we just spent two hours discussing the kind of invisible ties of, of cities and these circulations that make cities. So you're good to, interesting to hear <coughs> your view. Well, in, in my experience of, of being involved in city making, uh, there, there has been a sort of hierarchy of who's sort of in control and whose rules are unbendable and whose rules are strongest. And traditionally speaking, those people, I have nothing against people who build roads, those who deal with roads and those sort of infrastructures have the strongest rules. And because people are working in silos, there isn't often the understanding of what does it feel like to have a road that is either one meter, 10 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters, and their rules are strongest. So what, what's been, been happening quite often until hopefully recently is that when one then describes you know, a human-centered city or something that's, that's a bit better, that person is insistent on the rules normally through safety. Now, one of the big breakthroughs that happened in that uh, context was the whole concept of shared space that was first developed in, in, in the Netherlands, where the whole road system was very different, curbs were got rid of, you all know about all that sort of stuff, which was then copied in many other places. And so the way 
these cars and human interactions worked were completely different. In the first, because there normally were barriers, the rule, you have to have a barrier, meant that the car is in charge, whereas in the shared space concept, it flips round, and the car has to pay attention. So, for example, there was a big problem in Kensington, I'm just using a specific example, where the deputy mayor had to, because the rules, uh, someone was saying, well, who's responsible if someone dies? And the deputy mayor at the time, and then transition point, said, I will take responsibility if someone dies. So then they changed, took all the barriers away in Kensington High Street, which is a very busy street, and the street functions in a completely different way, back to rule shape, uh, vision and vision shapes rules. So the point I made about strategically principled, you've got something very clear that you want to achieve, those then define the rules. If you say we want sustainability and you, you actually mean it, and the building codes actually mean it, if you mean all those things rather than just saying them, then those shape the rules, and then you have to bend them. And the market, business, wants rules because they want certainty. It's not an anti-market or anti-anything. It's about certainty and predictability. And they, and business and others, will become innovative in the context of that because they have a structure and a form within which to work in. So that's what I mean. I'm just using sustainability as one example. I could use many others on, on, on that. So you have to bend it. I remember a, a second example in Adelaide, uh, the, which has very wide roads, as you know, and they were trying to boulevard, they, they were trying to make it more human. Yeah? So then the road people said their rules, then the environmental people said their rules, and then the other people said their rules, and the disability people said their rules. And this whole spaghetti of rules meant that the place was completely dysfunctional at the end, rather than starting from the other position and saying, what makes a great street for you? Describe to me a great street. If you describe the great street, and then you all agree, and I found that interdisciplinary working works, then you find that people reshape their rules according to the great street that they have just collectively defined. Perhaps I should have said that at the beginning, but that's been the most transformative experiences for me, operating in that way, where you collaboratively describe what you want, and then shape the rules according to it. Thank you. I'm mindful we have time left. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Seem to conclude. I can oh, hear we'll you. Oh, we'll the microphone. Charles, a question about leadership in the context of cities and where we're going to take cities to in the future. Given the poor leadership that we've had in the past, in, 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 in so well evidenced in so many cities, how, how do you see with the work that you're doing and have done in cities, uh, the future going in terms of leadership? That that's such a complicated question, but in the Creative Bureaucracy uh, Festival, we give awards, and the last award we get, we give several awards, and normally it's for unsung heroes. But the award we gave last time was to the uh, Finnish government and Demos Helsinki, who promoted a whole way of operating in terms of leadership, which they call humble leadership. And humble leadership has a number of features. Obviously, it's I, I don't know everything type of leadership. Um, but the other element of it is that the leadership adapts by allowing things to unfold. So just to take education as an example, just a simple example, but it applies to many sectors in Finland, is the teacher is teaching a student. Students now respond differently. They might have been trained 20 years ago. They're operating in a different way. The student affects the teacher. The teacher then goes back in a sort of learning loop that is ultimately in a continual life cycle changing the curriculum in a live way. So what that is doing 
is doing what I meant by strategically principled and tactically flexible. It's saying our intention is that learning is strong, that people are really switched on ultimately. But how you get there has to be uh, 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 adaptive. That, that's one part of the, 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 the answer. Um, I think the other point, it depends which continent you're in. I mean, clearly the participative imperative in Europe is incredibly strong, and there are obviously different continents that have different views on all of that. In Europe, you're increasingly having to, to some extent, create that involvement, which has a downside, of course, because things take longer and so on, and you don't actually sometimes get things done. So it, your question is more complicated because different cultures respond to what a leadership is in, in, in different ways. And because I'm looking at the clock and it's 1.3 minutes left, I, I'd like to have the conversation with you later over a cup of coffee. <laughs> uh, we will welcome more kind of off-site uh, discussions as well. But um, perhaps as we close, uh, if I can just engage Ali and Prasad in the kind of closing as well, um, what would be your message policy in, in terms of how the process can be better, how, how that listening part of, is, I mean, thinking of you, Stephen, and your work as a collective, where you kind of face different walls and, and areas, that asking permission stayed with me because I think it's really powerful that sometimes you don't do the same thing. Um, and, and, and so I would be curious to kind of hear from all three of you a very short message, just a couple words as to how do you think that process can, can improve or be better? Uh, what, what would be that, that message? Prasad as well, you can join in. No, I, 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 I'm the one who doesn't think that policies and plans make cities. So, so I mean, in fact, the cities make policies and plans. It's the politics it of the city. Is always the case? Yeah, yeah. It's the <laughs> politics of the city makes plans and, uh, uh, the, and policies. So, so and, and policy makers and plan makers have imperatives that they work with. You know, they have, they, they have, they have, they have, they are located within the city and its politics. So if you think like that, then, then it's a, it's a different equation. Then we, you trust in the city and figure out the way in which cities kind of, you know, happen and make themselves. So that, that, that's where we, we come from. I think that's the beginning of kind of all city planners and, and city makers to actually think that way and ask for that permission, part of that dialogue. I mean, th there, are, there are cities after cities which have failed, you know, and the cities and cities which, which, which have happened suddenly from nowhere. I kind of want to sum it up in one word, but I know I won't. But I'll start. Hang out more. What we ask, the, the unique moment with the, with, with the two ladies that I, that I wanted to share with you was that they, they understood what they wanted. They had a good idea of the product that they wanted to create. They had done a lot of work in owning the, the design of it, not at the planning scale, um, or the master planning scale, I should say, but at the, at, the, at the sort of community level. And they spent a tremendous amount of time hanging out and being present. And of course, typically then they move on to the question about what happens after that. But because of the shift in focus, it, 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 it called for a kind of co collective interdisciplinary approach to thinking what this thing is. So it's very much, I think, in this moment, and this doesn't happen all the time, but in Joburg, in that moment, the business about... How do you want your road to look? I mean, asking questions about roads and then reshaping something else that might not be referred to as a road ever again, you know? It's true. Ali? I would say it's really about redefining, maybe the, the first question was a, was a great one for that, because I think it's really about redefining the metrics of success <laughs> and, the, and the time spans in which to achieve it. I think a lot of cases we see these things that are extremely short-lived, both in, from the market and from the public sector, where either they have to make their profits within a certain area because the margins are purely dependent on costs of concrete and how cheaply you can build, 
or it's the, as a politician, your, your kind of margins are, I have one year to achieve success before I might be changed for another minister. Mm -hmm. But so it creates these extremely short-lived entities that don't go back and do any evaluations. They don't hang out and see what happens to a public park after five years because that's five ministers ago. Um, and so, I, and I, I think, it, so, and so I wonder how institutions can actually set up that longevity. How do you kind of set up both in, in terms of a, as an entity and also with communities ways of appraising and going back and asking and seeing. And I think as soon as someone can be evaluated on measure, these kind of long-term measures of success and building it into not only government entities, but also private entities and into universities as well, setting up those metrics and saying, well, now that we look at this 15 years later, we can say this is a success or a failure or was successful for a time, then the conversation would shift. But until we have that, a public park built in Bahrain 2005 will never be under kind of scrutiny on a public level rather than kind of a communal level. Um, and so to me, I think it's really about establishing those metrics as a community, not just as public entities. Thank you. I think escaping short-termism um, uh, definitely can be applied to all, <laughs> all entities, private and, and public sector. Um, but thank you. Thank you to all of you. Um, I would also like to thank both of our teams, um, Expo and Al Sirkan. Uh, and practitioners and thinkers who are part of our network who helped to shape this program this afternoon. And now I would like to invite you to join our artistic uh, intervention by Amelia Pika, uh, titled Assemble. I'll give just a quick introduction. Um, uh, Amelia Pika is an Argentinian London-based artist who grew up under a series of um, military dictatorships in Argentina and later witnessed the restoration of democracy and the joys and difficulties that came with post-totalitarian attempts at collective grassroots organizing. And so uh, Assemble is, uh, like much of uh, artists' work, examines how form determines the ways in which we come together. Um, initially performed outside of Argentina's House of Congress in Plaza de, de los Dos Congresos, Buenos Aires, the piece continues this line of inquiry by exploring the circle as an ancient form of gathering. Its title is a um, truncation of the Spanish word assemble and is really imagined for a public square or a meeting place. And so, uh, we would like to extend our sincere gratitude to the artist and the Guggenheim Museum for loaning us to work, uh, as well as the students of NYU UAD who will be performing the piece. We invite you all to stay in your seats while the performance exit the auditorium and to then follow them outside um, to see the performance at Gaff Circle, which is just outside the sustainability. So, we would like to invite the performers um, to enter the stage, and then as they pass through, we will be following oh. them. That's interesting. women here. It's all for balance.
directly from the bottom.
زائراً العزيز هل أنت بحاجة إلى المساعدة للتجول في أرجاء إكسبو 2020؟ يمكنك استخدام واحدة من حفلات